Um, all right, so there we go. So first and foremost, before I begin anything like this, I always like to make sure that there's, there's a disclaimer involved that everything that we share today is purely educational in nature and the material in that include, that's included in this discussion uh, may involve one or more related tax related topics. So we wanna make sure that number one, I don't give tax or legal advice. And secondarily, we wanna make sure that um, any information that you see here, that you can have the opportunity to connect with your own advisors um, or even myself as part of that team uh, to make sure that anything that we share here today um, is in line with the goals and objectives that you have and is suitable in terms of a recommendation. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. And so when we talk about capital accumulation and protection, and we call it the six ugly mistakes. And now on the flip side of that, on a more positive note, it can be six absolutely key areas of opportunity. So really is how you frame it from a mindset perspective. And, you know, we're at the end of the year. This is a time to assess a lot of different things, right? Um, if you've looked at what's happened in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world and also domestically here in the United States, it's a lot of, a lot of things going on, right? Uh, the Fed just raised interest rates by another half percent today. Um, you know, uh, we've seen interest rate hikes just on a tremendous level to counterbalance the, the aspect of inflation. Um, the housing market, obviously, you know, is uh, a little bit volatile in nature. Um, there's a lot of different things going on. Markets, you know, are up and down. So there's so many things going on and a lot of uncertainty as it relates to uh, what's happening in the global economy the domestic economy was happening in the markets. But I always like to say there's tried and true principles and ways and schools of thought, right? When we talk about accumulating and protecting wealth. And just kind of going off the slide here, it says if a person adequately addresses these six key areas, you don't have to look at these six key areas as ugly mistakes anymore. I want to start to reframe that mindset, you know, because often than not, I will tell you that there is not one thing outside of these six key areas that I can think of that encompasses a comprehensive and proactive plan um, when we deal with our clients. Um, these, these six key areas are vitally critical, whether you're planning on an individual basis or you're planning as a business owner, okay? And again, we're gonna be talking more about these here in a few, but I wanna reframe that mindset from looking at it as, potentially do I have mistakes, to looking at it as areas of opportunity, okay? Um, so it says if a person adequately addresses these six key areas, his or her capital accumulation and protection plan may be optimized with that person's means. Now, again, on the flip side, they can become mistakes if you don't fail to adequately address any one of these six key areas. And I can tell you there's a few, few of them that are more foundational in nature, and there's a few of them more at the top of the, of the totem pole. If you kind of think of your planning um, like a triangle, on the base of that triangle, there's a foundation. We're going to be talking more about what that foundation actually is. That's the critical component. If you imagine a house, right? If you imagine a house with cracks in the foundation, right? You think that house is going to be there 20, 30 years from now? And if you, I've seen, um, you know, many of my clients have, um, you know, grandparents that have had houses for 40, 50 years that have withstood the test of time. In fact, houses that are here in Florida, for that matter, that have been through hurricanes, right? Um, that they're still st standing, still sturdy and still on solid foundation. But those houses have strong, you know, they were built strong to withstand a lot of these different things. There's buildings here in Florida that are that are built with solid foundation. What is my point? The point is that your planning is all prevalent on ensuring that you have a strong foundation to work from. And so that's part of the part of the first focus that we're going to look at is we want to make sure that that foundation is set no matter what. And of course, then clients should address these six key areas, optimize gains and minimize threats to capital. OK, so again, we're looking at it from an opportunity, but we're also looking at it from a defensive perspective. So here are the six key areas, right? 
And again, there could be mistakes and they can also be areas of opportunity. Just keep that in mind as we go through this. So the first is income protection, capital risk, income tax reduction, asset protection, retirement and the state plan, right? Now, there's a lot of people that will say, hey, I need to start with this or I want to start with this. We're going to go through an evolution again to where, again, we're building from a foundation up from, from the triangle. So let's talk about these areas in more detail. So as you can imagine, income protection is that foundation, okay? It is the set foundation of everything that we do from a financial planning or financial services perspective, okay? And so when we look at this, you see death, disability, or illness may cause a loss of income or capital. Extended care planning is also another area that we look at from a foundational perspective. If somebody needed to take care of you for an extended period of time, what does that do to not only your income, but also the consequences that it would have on somebody else within your family, or perhaps maybe a business partner or, or what have you, okay? And you can see here it says common ways to protect against such losses include proper life insurance planning, proper disability or income protection planning. Again, extended care planning, of course, medical insurance. And there's a lot of misnomers, there's a lot of miseducation out there that myself and my team and all of us pretty much at New York Life as a company, we're looking to dispel a lot of these different myths as it relates to these different areas because, um, you know, we'll hear a lot of clients think, you know, or, or have misnomers about what medical insurance will cover um, or what Medicare will cover. And so these are all things that, again, we want to make sure that our, our clients are well-informed and well-versed so they can build this foundation strong. Okay. We talk about capital assets. So again, we we just started with the foundation. Now let's start to start to build this house here. So we talk about capital risk. And again, there's a lot of different things that are going on within today's economy, both domestically and internationally, that has a bearing effect on how we create wealth in, in today's environment, right? You know, people have a lot of money in 401ks and IRAs and other qualified plans. If you're a business owner, also uh, SEP IRAs, you know, or, or it could be simple IRAs, it could be solo 401ks, what have you. Many of those different plans are funded by the way of stocks, bonds, and, and, and cash and other instruments, right? But again, measuring your tolerance for risk is very, very important. And again, losses can occur between a lot of these different risks, right? So, some techniques that obviously are available are diversification, asset allocation techniques, which can be used to optimize not only the returns, but commensurate with the level of risk that you're willing to accept. So let me repeat that. You wanna, we wanna optimize the return commensurate with the level of risk that you're willing to take, which is huge, right? And often, often or not, what we see is when a client comes in, they have no idea what their risk tolerance is in terms of where they are. They could be 55 years old and say, hey, you know what, I think I'm conservative, what their portfolio says otherwise, right? And so these are things that we want to be cognizant of, especially as our life goals continue to change. You know, if you're near you know, if obviously if you're in business and you say, you know, hey, you know, I want to maybe sell my business over the next five years, you know, well, how does that relate to everything else that you have going on inside your portfolio? How does that affect your current lifestyle or future lifestyle moving forward? Right. These are all things that we want to be cognizant of. Right. So when we talk about personally owned businesses as a capital asset, when a bit when a person owns a business, the business is an asset of the owner. Business owners often face issues that passive investors do not. Obviously, operations, things of that nature, having to make sure that all the different points inside the business are covered, right? You've got the general partners, you've got the limited partners, right? Reverse, uh, excuse me, risk diversification should be a priority, right? Um, and of course, then also exit planning. One of the things that when I say exit planning, people kind of get defensive. They're like, well, you know what? I, I want to work as long as possible. I'm not going to ever really sell my business or, 
or really think about leaving my business because I love my business so much. And I often say, you know what, that's true. And I didn't say you didn't love your business. But at the end of the day, there are things that do happen. And so we need to be cognizant of those things and relate that to real life and say, look, have you named a potential successor owner in the event of a sickness or injury or premature death? Often when I ask that question to business owners, people kind of, you know, kind of stop in their tracks and think. And when they start to think, they're really, they're really saying to themselves, you know what, I haven't really given that much thought. And we want to make sure that that is a forefront of the conversation because exit planning is not something that is 20, 30 years down the road. It's something that you would start from the very beginning of your business. From the moment that you open your business, exit planning should be a consideration in your planning process. And of course, then key person needs should be explored. I was just working with an architectural firm up in Michigan, right? So one owner three key people. And she asked me, you know, like, Roger, should I consider key man for myself as well? I said, well, you're the visionary. Of course. Right. If something happened to you, what would you want to happen to have happen to the architectural firm? Would you want the lead architect that's there now to assume ownership role? And just like, well, I'm not sure if they would want to. Have you had that conversation? And they say, well, no, I haven't had that conversation. And I was like, this is the time that you start, to, you want to start to have these conversations with your key people. The best time to do that is right now, because right now, obviously, is at the end of the year, 2023 could present a, a number of different opportunities, but also could present a number of different challenges. Hmm. And so we want to start thinking about these things as business owners, because, again, not everyone, not everything is rainbows and, and, and lollipops. It's real life stuff that we've got to start really thinking about. And part of that is planning for an exit, whether that's a forced exit or whether that's a natural exit. So income tax reduction, right? I'm assuming that everyone here doesn't like to pay taxes. <laughs> I'm assuming that everyone pays taxes in some way, shape or form, right? At the end of the day, taxes are a part of what we do, right? It's part of part of life and things of that nature. There's two certainties, what? Death and taxes, right? So at the end of the day, to accumulate capital efficiently, get this, keeping income taxes as low as possible may be helpful. Now, here's the thing. We're in the lowest tax freight environment in the history of the United States currently. We're in the lowest tax rate time of any time in history. If you look at what it was back in World War II, the highest top marginal tax rate was 94%, 94 cents on the dollar was taxed. You, if, and then they actually interviewed Ronald Reagan. He said, look, I only made a certain amount of money because guess what? I couldn't keep the rest. When he was, when, when he was an actor, right? Way back when. They talked, they talked to him about that. I was like, look, I only made a certain amount because I, I know I couldn't keep the rest, right? And so when we look at income tax planning and strategies, obviously we want to have the benefit of working with a, a top-notch CPA that does ta proactive tax planning, not tax preparation, right? There's a lot of people that can go out there and prepare taxes. We're actually talking about a tax strategist that can really go in and provide you ongoing proactive and comprehensive views on how to lessen the impact of taxes, not just now, but of course in the future as a business owner. Four major strategies. You want to write these down. Deduct expenses. We want to def we can look at deferring income. We want we can divert income to others. And we can convert taxable income into non-taxable income. I'm going to pull this out of the slide deck, and I want to I want to touch on these for a little bit. Hopefully, everybody can see this just a little bit clearer here. Okay, can't blow that up as much as I can, but um, so hopefully everybody. I'll I'll read these because I want to make sure everybody gets this. 
So from a deduction perspective, taxable income can be reduced by maximizing deductions. Business expenses and similar deductions may reduce adjusted gross income. Other deductions can be made from adjusted gross income to reduce taxable income. Now, we're familiar with standard deductions and itemized deductions. So most people can take a standard deduction and many others choose to itemize their deductions. Itemized deductions include expenses for things like healthcare, state and local taxes, personal property taxes, mortgage interest, charitable gifts, right? Especially as a business owner, you might have a certain charity that you want to support, right? Tax preparation fees and investment related expenses. In addition, tax credits may be available to some expenditures, um, like the employee tax credit is one uh, was one aspect to it. And again, I'm not an expert in that area, but I do want you to make sure that you have the ability to work with your CPA or tax professional in this area and ask them these questions. You know, what are some of the ways that I can look at to effectively reduce my tax burden, not just in the short term, but also in the long term? Defer. Now, defer is a is a fancy term for postpone. That's all it is, right? When we heard the word defer, just think of the word postpone. Okay. So deferring income recognition to a later date may provide two tax advantages, right? First capital would be otherwise paid in taxes may be invested for a return, i.e., like a 401k, right? Second, since deferred income will normally be taxed at a later date, the income may be possibly be received when the taxpayer is in a lower tax bracket. Now, I will say this. If you're already in a high income tax rate, the chances of you being in a lower tax rate at some point in the future is probably slim to none. And if I asked everybody, what do you think tax rates are going to do in the future, go up or down, what would you say? If you can go like this, right. They're going to go up. And so, again, we got to be constant because what I see from my clients is I see a lot of money in deferred instruments, 401ks, IRAs, traditional IRAs, SEP IRAs, what have you. You may have some of that in your own portfolio right now. And the question is, is it's not so much, hey, look, you know, is this bad? It's not that it's bad. You want to be constant in the fact that how does that affect you long term when, it, when you go when you get to the retirement stage of your life? How does that affect Social Security? How does that affect your net income when you decide to retire? How long will that money last for your life expectancy? These are all questions that we need to ask ourselves, right? Divert. Diverting means that let's say I have a child or whatever the case may be. Maybe I have a child in the business. How can I maybe use, you know, the child in that aspect as a way to divert, you know, from a high income tax bracket? I can divert income or gains persons or entities in a lower tax bracket, okay? And that's one aspect of it. And then convert is really looking at, again, going back to my point about, you know, tax rates are at the lowest point of any time in history, right? People are considering looking at converting traditional IRAs if they have traditional IRAs. And if it's in the appropriate aspect for them, because this is, again, I, I want to make sure this is clear. This is not a recommendation, but people, you know, will, will utilize this strategy. They'll utilize a they'll have a traditional IRA that says, well, how can I use this? And I, I would like to see if I can get to a point where I pay no income tax when I do take the money out. Should I consider paying the tax now? And that's where a traditional, uh, a traditional IRA could be verted to a Roth IRA or a Roth conversion, right? And again, that's another aspect um, to ensuring that eventually you have long-term tax-free retirement income, okay? Of course, also, uh, we, wanna, we don't want to neglect the importance and also the positioning of what life insurance can do, right? Life insurance may sometimes help accomplish three of the four objectives, okay? So premiums are not deductible. But premium, the uh, permanent uh, policy cash values may grow tax deferred. But here's the thing: I can ultimately take out those proceeds tax-free inside the policy to create a long-term income. And again, from a from a tax reduction perspective, that's more of a longer-term tax reduction strategy. Okay, it can help also protect my Social Security because I know cash values are not counted against me as income. Right. So 
if we look at Social Security, Social Security can get taxed as much as 85 percent if we have a, if we have too much provisional income, right? And so we want to create sources of capital that could potentially be not accounted against that, so that we can protect our Social Security benefits. Okay. All right. Let's go back to my slides here. Okay. Before I continue, everyone going good? Give me a thumbs up, please. Awesome, awesome. Good, good, good. Asset protection, right? Protection from lawsuits and other risks. Now, again, we're talking about ugly mistakes. This is an absolutely ugly mistake of a business owner not being cognizant of what risks are involved in their particular business. We're in a litigious society, right? So things like liability and property insurance is not always enough to provide optimal protection, right? Four techniques are often used, right? Exempt assets under state and federal law. So if you hear, if you know somebody besides myself in the Sunshine State, right, here in Florida, in the state of Florida, there's a lot of asset protection provisions. Think of O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson had his NFL pension. The Goldman tried to attach that in the $33.5 million lawsuit, and they could never get it. Why? Because it was a protected asset. Okay? Life insurance cash values, pension plans are all protected here in the state of Florida. Now, there are provisions in different states, and so you got to look at those states' laws and see if those provisions, I know in Georgia, there's also full asset protection as well, right? Corporations and limited liability organizations, right? Trusts. Now, here's the thing, too, right? Just because you have a trust doesn't mean it's fully asset protected, right? So these are things that you want to work with with your attorney, ensuring that you have provisions as a business owner to ensure that, look, if I were, were forever to get sued, I want to make sure that I have provisions underneath the law to ensure that my assets are protected from frivolous lawsuits or from the claims of creditors. And again, that could be one of the worst mistakes that people make is not, is not addressing this in full. Okay. Retirement planning. Okay. Retirement planning is obviously a big part of everybody's life. It's a great part of a business owner's life. Now, one thing that I will often see is that the net worth of a business owner is, pre is predominantly their business, right? And so how do we look at now diversifying that into predictable retirement income streams? And in today's environment, especially because everything is such in flux, how do we get to a point where we can actually have a guaranteed, a portion of our income guaranteed, okay? So hear what I'm saying, a portion of our income to cover all of our natural expenses that we would have in retirement, right? So if we can have a portion of our retirement income guaranteed, that just gives us peace of mind, right? And I'm a big proponent, huge proponent of guaranteed lifetime income, right? Often what we see is a lot of our, our, our folks that are looking to plan for retirement, maybe they're three or five years out or even seven years out away from retirement, they're so focused in the growth phase that they've never really looked at their portfolio and said, maybe do I need to make some start to make some adjustments because I can no longer be at the same tolerance for risk that I was five, seven, even 10 years ago. OK, so three major ways to accumulate capital for retirement, qualified retirement plans, 401ks, IRAs, non-qualified retirement plans, right, um, like pension plans, and then after tax accumulation. That could mean Roth IRAs. That could mean cash value life insurance. These are all elements of after-tax accumulations. One should estimate the amount of capital necessary, right? So in terms of retirement income planning, we should have a full retirement income plan. Assessing what would it actually take to live the type of lifestyle that you currently have. Let's say if you're maybe three to five years, five years or even seven years away from retirement, that analysis should be done now and assess now so that we can kind of get an idea of what needs to be done for your long-term future. Because again, one of the biggest ugly mistakes in this is <clears throat> assuming that you have enough capital, 
when you really don't. And then when the market drops, you can no longer live your current standard of living that you live today. So you're forced now to have a lifestyle reduction. And we don't ever want to be in that picture. And then the last one is estate planning, okay? And I'm going to, again, pull this out here. So if a person does not have a will, they may die in test state. Therefore, their property would pass according to the state and test state and test statutes. I don't know about you, but I do not want the government telling me what the heck to do with my stuff. <laughs> so, um, again, and it's an element of privacy, right? Some property does not pass by instead instead state of probate. So, you know, probate, if you've ever been through it, if you ever know somebody that's been through it, it can be a hassle and a half, right? It can be costly. So, again, these are things that we want to ensure that we keep to a minimum. In fact, we can, in a lot of cases, we want to eliminate that aspect of it. So, for instance, life insurance or property owned by joint tenants with rights to survivorship, the filing of assets, do not normally pass by in test state or, pro or probate. Texas laws vary from state to state, but can result in undesirable situations. For example, the surviving spouse may not be entitled to, to the entire amount of a deceased spouse's estate if may be divided between the spouse and surviving children. Children from a prior marriage, here, get this, children from a prior marriage may be entitled to a portion of the estate. Assets may be passed outright to the children. With minor children, a former spouse or non-spouse may end up as a guardian with substantial control over those assets. I know I said a mouthful there, but that's really, really powerful. Is you get to decide and control how those assets are dispersed with proper planning. Obviously, you get to decide how your medical decisions are done through the living will. You get to decide how your assets are dispersed through the living. If there's a live, is there a need? If there's a need for a living trust, then again, working with your attorney can help you guide not just from the medical and the financial side, but also again talking about the asset protection side as well. Okay. So if a person has a properly executed will, their property will normally pass according to the designations of the will. However, the property may be subject to probate costs and estate taxes. And then if the estate is large enough and passes to a non-spouse beneficiary, get this, estate taxes may be due at the death of the first spouse. Okay, it's very powerful. Considering tax-wise wills of trust, which reflect your so so again, proper planning, you know, the usage of the marital marital deduction, uh, you know, all those types of things. We want to make sure that again. If you have, if you're in a situation where your state is sizable, we want to make sure that you're paying the least amount of tax. In fact, if we can get to that point, where we're paying no tax at all. And that's another thing as well. So, um, but these are all things that we, again, we need to be confident of, right? Estate planning is one of those biggest ugly mistakes because we don't think about it. If you look at Prince, if you look at uh, Joe Robbie. If you look at many of these different people that we, you know, we saw as, as great, you know, actors or people in public celebrity, these are individuals that didn't have an estate plan, right? I believe Elvis Presley as well. These are all individuals that had no estate plan. They had no formal planning, right? Um, and then there's countless individuals. I mean, I, I've seen uh, singers you know, the girlfriend of a singer could not get access to any of the estate because she wasn't in, in legal. From a, from a legal perspective, she had no entitlement to that, right? And again, these are the critical mistakes. In fact, I've seen where it's the ex-spouse, right? They, the estate plan was done five years ago. The estate had grown since then. Maybe they sold a business at that point, but the ex-spouse was on is it was in is it was in the trust and they never updated it right and so these are all critical things i've seen estate plans from early 2000s that had never gotten updated you know how many things have changed since the early 2000s so again i keep going back to the point about do we want these six key areas as areas of inefficiency and turmoil 
or do we want these as areas of opportunity? Right now, we're in a time where we're doing a lot of reflection, right? End of the year. To each and every one of you, this should be an opportunity to assess this, these six key areas and look at it and say, you know what? Am I optimally positioned? This is a key question I want everyone to take away. Am I optimally positioned in these six key areas like I thought I was? Look at your income protection plan. Do you have do you have a strategy, a written strategy for extended care planning? Most people don't. Mm -hmm. I know that I am well, number one, I'm a certified long-term care specialist, right? And so in doing that curriculum, I've seen countless case studies after countless case studies of people that never took the time to plan for extended care planning. Okay. It is critically important. And I will say this. It is critically important, especially for women, mm -hmm. right? You may have somebody that you know, uh, maybe a parent or for that matter, a friend that has had, you know, somebody going through extended care planning, right? And again, these are all instances that, again, we do a lot of working with our clients, getting them to understand how all these are symbiotic, right? They're all symbiotic to each other. You have one of these areas off that could completely destroy everything you've worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the workbook here. And hopefully everybody has been taking notes and um, really enjoyed <laughs> today's session. But, um, you know, what we wanted to accomplish today um, is we want, to, we want to help you get on the right track to secure your family's financial future as a business owner, right? We want to look at, okay, how does your business correlate to your personal net worth and all those kinds of things? How does that factor into your estate planning, right? Also, for that matter, as a business owner, you should be, if you have employees or, or, or anything of that nature, you should be looking at how do you get this information to them as well, mm -hmm. okay? process. We want to make sure that, again, we covered these. We want to cover basic personal and estate planning concepts. We, we did that. Um, educating you how those concepts actually apply to your own personal life. And you might see some instances where those do. And then really putting you on a, on a, on a right path is analyzing where are the areas of inefficiency currently right now, right? Every plan can be made better, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why a plan can be made better is because of, of unique strategies that could help it be, be, become better, right? Um, I often say to my clients, it's not the products that make your plan effective. It's the strategies. It's not the golf club, it's the golf swing, mm -hmm. right? If you like, if you like golf, right? If you like golf. So, <laughs> so golf, golf is, the, is, is, is a great analogy that I use for help people understand, look, it's the mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. Right. If you have an outdated estate plan, you know you do. If you if if you're in that situation, now's the time to get that updated. We're at the end of the year. 2023 can be a completely different year for you and for people that you know and for those that you love by simply being proactive. And again, going back to those six key areas, right? Um, if I can blow this up here a little bit. Okay. These are questions that you might want to ask yourself. What if I became disabled? What if I have long-term health issues? What if I die too soon? Okay. Am I taking advantage of these different various income tax strategies right now? Am I familiar with them? Right. Capital risk. Do I have a proper asset allocation plan currently for the what I'm trying to accomplish financially? And is it commensurate with the level of risk that I'm willing to take? Asset protection. So I have an asset protection plan, right? Um, retirement planning. Have I set up my retirement planning strategy, right? What is the composition of where I'm currently at? And is that, and if I kept doing what I'm doing, what potentially could happen moving forward if I don't change a thing? Is that a good or bad thing? And do, am I willing to, here's the key thing. Am I willing to accept that result if I don't change anything? Am I willing to accept that result if I don't change anything? Right. And that's what because the biggest thing is people don't make decisions to do something different until there's a pain point. 
on if there's an actual pain point, on if there's an actual reason behind it, right? Estate planning. What do I own? What do I want to receive it? How do I get it to them? And how do I maximize the benefit? Okay. And Barb's going to be getting this workbook out to you so that you have this um, as a tangible resource at the conclusion of our presentation today. So you can start to think about this over the course of the holidays. I want to put this out there as well. I'm going to be offering a complimentary consultation to everyone that they, if they would like to have their own personal situation reviewed or just address some questions that they may have, I'm going to open my calendar for that as well so that people can hop on the calendar to do that. Um, this has been such great information. I wanted to open up the floor to a few questions. Um, I know somebody, I'm just trying to go back here, that um, said, asked a question about, um, um, for the, I don't know, it's, it might be more for an attorney, but don't you have to be married 10 plus years for monies to go to a former spouse? Um, I'm not quite sure about that. That could be more of a legal question. It could be state to state as well. Yes, ma'am. And I would definitely uh, adhere to the legal counsel for that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, the thing about, you know, what I love about your presentation is it's holistic and it does look at, at all the parts individually and then holistically. And as we are all small business owners, we really need to take the time to look at each one of these pieces because, you know, you've heard the story about what if you had a money machine in your basement and every day it made money for you? You know, wouldn't it be wouldn't you protect it from floods? Wouldn't you protect it from, you know, breaking down? Wouldn't you protect it, make sure that it kept making you money? Well, that's us. <laughs> you know, we're we're the money-making machine. So we have to make sure that we have self-protection and are really protected for what if we, you know, get disabled and can't work, if you are the core to your, you know, business. Um, it's so important. And then... Um, yeah, so here's a good question. What are the best practices for selecting long-term care insurance, which is so important? It's very expensive. That's why a lot of people balk at it. But you have to really look at the pros and the benefits. And again, at your whole holistic plan. Wouldn't you agree, Roger? Yes, ma'am. And I'm actually going to pull up a resource because I want to address that that question of thought about long-term care. Um, so long-term care is more than just insurance. Okay, uh, let's go. I want to be very clear on that. It's more about the planning process, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I want to pull up a resource here if I can. And, I, and also, Barb, I, I want to make this available to everybody as well. Um, let me just let me gather this. Yeah, while you're pulling that up, I do want to mention that, you know, at Purse Strings, we have this family emergency binder that we put together, and it's everything that you could possibly need for a family. Because, you know, my um, husband's mother, uh, you know, she fell and ended up in the hospital. We needed to know what are all the meds that she's on and who are all her doctors and how do we get in and out of her apartment? And, you know, these things happen all the time. You know, the one thing we didn't think about, we didn't put on there, she lost her phone. Mm -hmm. So the Find My Phone app, now we're thinking we need to make sure that we can track and find her phone as well. But, you know, as I was saying earlier, as the swell of baby boomers are aging, now we're in this place where we are really the sandwich generation, some of us who are still taking care of their own children and taking care of their parents. And we really need to open those dialogues and, and really learn and know where where's the money, where, who, who's signing on the financial accounts, who are the uh, financial power of attorney, who's the healthcare power of attorney, where are the wills, you know, who are the beneficiaries, who's who's in charge of all of these decisions, and where's all this information? Because, you know, there's been a time where so much of that was held close to the vest until an emergency happened and the people started to scramble. So at Purse Strings, we're trying to open this dialogue have this information front and center so that people have a plan in place. Go ahead, Roger. All right. Um, in terms of long-term care, right? These are critical areas when we talk about long-term care planning that should be addressed. So, so let's look at it from, these, from this perspective here. First and foremost, who, right? Who would be in charge of your care? Would they be a full-time caregiver? Where they need to hire somebody? And have you had these conversations and discussed the roles that are, are applicable within your care? 
Okay. Um, where obviously with proper planning, I'll say this with proper planning, the intention is obviously to be at home, right? And it can be with proper planning, right? If that includes long-term care insurance as an option, wonderful. From a from a risk perspective, it's the most efficient solution from that perspective because you're talking about using pennies on the dollar to provide you with a, a way to defer the risk to an uh, insurance company. Okay, um, and then of course, then how will you pay for it? And I think the biggest thing is it's very difficult to really wrap your mind around what care costs today. Yeah. And also what it would cost in the, in the future, future, five to 10 years from now. We're not going to cover that 100% with long-term care insurance. And I think that's the misconception where people say it's too expensive because they're looking at it from a perspective of trying to cover it 100%. It may, so it may be saying, look, you know, let's say the cost in your area maybe is $7,500 a month. How much of that do you want to be responsible for? And how much of that do we want to preserve, we want to defer to an insurance company, right? And, you know, so those are things that we want to look at. We'll do a, a really in-depth analysis in the specific area that you're in. Like, for example, in the city of Chicago, we'll look at what the city of Chicago is from a cost perspective with home care, what it is for, you know, again, a two-bedroom or private nursing home. And again, with proper planning, the intention should always be, I want to have care in home as my primary option, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I want to be able to have it with these types of individuals, with skilled people, but I want my family involved, perhaps maybe as in, from an administration perspective, mm -hmm. you know? Or it might be different, it might be a different altogether, right? Um, you know, because people will say, well, do I really want, you know, my daughter or, you know, my son um, to be able to revert their lifestyle and of course, and their income sources. Mm -hmm. So the consequence of planning, not planning for long-term care, extended care planning, it's not just, it's not assets, it's income. It's income mm -hmm. from you and the consequences to them is really what we want to be conscious of, right? But again, going back to the point about being too expensive, I will say this, some long-term care or some a written plan with an element of long-term care insurance is better than nothing, right? Because Matt, what, what is expensive is that when that burden's 100% on you, and if your health is in a position where you're actually eligible and able to qualify, it might behoove you to start looking into that as a source to ensure that you have a plan in place for extended care planning. I can tell you this, without an extended care planning strategy, your plan is just basically a plan that it, it, that can fall apart within a matter of a year or two, maybe even three years. Mm -hmm. so yeah. A lifetime of work gone because we didn't consider the impact of extended care planning. In my slide deck. There you are. Well, he's always on our purse string site. Purstrings.co is where you can go to find any type of financial professional. And um, also um, directly, here's all of his information directly as well. 